Welcome to episode 28 of the Cycling Europe podcast. My name is Andrew Sykes. Now, most of this podcast is dedicated to an interview with Simon Parker, the travel writer, broadcaster and newspaper columnist. But before we get to that, here's a short message from Tim Moss, one of the organisers of the Cycle Touring Festival that kicks off on February 12th. The Cycle Touring Festival has always been a celebration of getting out and exploring with your bike. Now, obviously we're limited with lockdown at the moment, hence the need to go entirely virtual again this year. But the beauty of being online is that we get to reach a much wider audience, not just hundreds of people, but thousands, not just the UK, but international. The programme is jam-packed to the rafters for, the, for a full week this year. There's opportunity to meet various authors like Jack Thurston, who wrote Lost Lanes, and A&E Dr. Stephen Faves, who spent six years cycling around the world. We've got the fastest female round the world cyclist interviewing the fastest tandem round the world cyclists. We've got people cycling the Pamirs and the Karakaram, and we've got someone cycling around the UK with a tape recorder c- capturing the sounds of the British Isles. We've got a curated film program of the best new bike movies from the year. And because it spans half term, there are lots of talks and events about cycling as a family. And we also span Valentine's Day. So we've got a little debate on the night itself because we'll all be locked down anyway about whether it's better to cycle solo or as a couple. And given the times that we're in, we've got a particular talk dedicated to touring in a time of COVID and some of the cycling trips that people did in 2020 featuring Mr. Sykes himself. Everything's free at the festival, but you do need to register in advance um, and donations to help cover costs are welcome. So visit www.cycletouringfestival.co.uk and I hope to see some of you there. Thanks, Tim. As he mentioned, I'll be appearing at the festival in the first session at 8pm on February 12th. Now, before we hear from Simon Parker, a reminder that if you enjoy listening to the Cycling Europe podcast, please take a few moments to rate the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, Google, or wherever you happen to be listening. It would be much appreciated. Now, as I was saying, Simon Parker is a travel writer, broadcaster, and newspaper columnist. He's travelled to over 100 countries on reporting assignments for the BBC, the Daily Telegraph, and the Independent. He also has a sideline in cycle touring. In 2016, he sailed and cycled from China to London, and in 2018, he set off from northern Norway and cycled 3,000 kilometres south to the southern tip of Sweden. His six-week adventure is now the subject of a documentary available on Amazon Prime Video. I started by asking Simon to introduce himself. Yeah, so my name is Simon Parker. I'm a travel writer, a journalist and a broadcaster. And in any normal circumstances, I travel around the world for the BBC and the Telegraph and the Independent uh, to about 30 or 40 countries a year in normal times. And I write articles and make radio dispatches and more lately make um, television documentaries. And I get to go to all sorts of interesting places. And we're going to talk about the specifically about the, the two cycles that you've made in recent years, which have also been the um, subject of documentaries for radio and the second one for TV. But before we come to any of that, have you been a lifelong cyclist? How long have you been cycling? Um, I started cycling probably like most of Britain around the 2012 Olympics, I think. So probably about 10 years or so. I wouldn't consider myself much of a cyclist, if I'm honest. I, I'm i not one of those people who's obsessed with weight saving or carbon fibre frames. I don't think I've ever once bought a cycling magazine or spent more than about three minutes on a, a cycling <laughs> website. I'm not one of those cycling nerds by any stretch of the imagination. But I am a, I am a person who really likes big overland adventures and even 15 years ago when I really started to travel a lot around the world I used to hitchhike around Australia and New Zealand and do big overland journeys in buses and trains and then that gradually just moved and and transitioned to, to bicycles really. 
And the thing I just love about being on my bike is that I can travel massive distances or at least, you know, 80 or 100 miles a day. And at the end of a three or four week trip, I'm leaner, I feel fitter. And I don't think there's many jobs on the planet which you get to do that sort of thing. Yeah, and there's a there's a quote, I think it's in the radio documentary about when you cycle across America. Cycling at 10 miles per hour is my perfect speed. It's not so fast, I feel I'm missing the amazing things around me and not so slow, I feel I'm wading from place to place. Certainly, yeah, I think um, over the years I've just worked out that cycling is my perfect speed. It just appeals to my very nature. I find walking, I find hiking a little bit too slow, a little bit too sluggish. But then on the other end of that spectrum, I find traveling around by car and plane and train just to be far too fast. And it it gets me all agitated and pent up. But actually, yeah, moving it about 10, 12 miles per hour with on a on a fully loaded bicycle for me is just the perfect pace to travel. So before you cycled across America, what year was that? 2016. Right. So before you did that journey, uh, and we'll come to that in a few seconds, where had you cycled long distance? So my first proper bike ride was probably about eight or nine years ago, in which a group of mates were doing a charity bike ride from Brighton to Rome. And uh, I just jumped at the opportunity to do that. And uh, yeah, it took us about three weeks to cycle from Brighton all the way down to Rome. It was about 1,200 miles or something like that. And I think there were about 12 of us and we had a um, support van which was following us. And ever since that, I I learned that I really like traveling big overland distances on my bicycle. But if I'm totally honest, I'm not a massive fan of doing it with lots of people. I don't like being in big groups generally. I like doing things under my own steam and in my own company. And I also couldn't really shake the feeling that having someone following you carrying your bags was a lot like cheating. And I have a bit too much pride, I guess, and my ego is probably a little bit too big to, to have that sort of thing. So I really like the idea that I'm carrying everything I need and I'm totally self-sufficient. That really appeals to my quite independent spirit, I think. Well, that's interesting what you've just said about not being comfortable cycling in groups of people or traveling in groups of people, because in 2016, when you did this journey from China to London, there was only the bit from the West Coast of America to the East Coast of America, which was on a bicycle and you were by yourself. But you certainly weren't by yourself for the other two bits from China to the West Coast or from the East Coast back to Europe. Can you tell people how you were traveling? Yes. So the whole concept of that story and that project was to sail and cycle halfway around the world, 15,000 miles from China to London. So as a journalist, as a travel writer, I managed to blag my way onto the round the world yacht race and I convinced them to let me sail across the Pacific. So I joined a team in the round the world yacht race and we sailed across the Pacific and I was in a a 70 foot racing yacht with everything stripped down. So it's really uncomfortable. You only have bunks and a small galley and you just sail hardcore into the wind. 300 or so miles a day, 24 hours a day. It's just relentless in ginormous Pacific seas. And you get from one side of the ocean to the next as quickly as physically possible. And I was in a crew, I think, of about 10 or 11 people on this 24 hour constant watch cycle. So you're on for four hours, you sleep for four hours, you're on. And that goes on for 30 days or so. And it's just the most uncomfortable, horrible situation. So I convinced the Telegraph and the BBC that I was going to go off and do this big journey. But then I started looking at maps of the world and I started dreaming up this idea to travel halfway around the planet completely over land and sea. So when we arrived in Seattle, the group of yachts sailed around America to go to New York. And I set them this challenge that I was going to race them to New York. So... I had a couple of days to relax in Seattle 
And then I grabbed my bicycle and it took me seven weeks to cycle across America. And at the same time I was cycling across America, uh, this fleet of yachts was also trying to race to New York. It took me 48 days and I arrived in New York 12 hours before this fleet of yachts. Uh, and then I jumped back into another team and then sailed across uh, across the ocean with them. So the whole kind of concept of the project was to explore the dynamics of team and solo endurance. And that documentary, that audio documentary, you can still hear it. It's still on BBC Sounds. And one of the first things that you say in that documentary, it's recorded on the, uh, did it, was it Shanghai you said? you, you uh, Qingdao. Qingdao. Uh, Qingdao, it's on the, um, yeah, on the eastern seaboard of China. The first thing you record in that documentary is the fact that you're terrified. So you're clearly outside your comfort zone when it comes to presumably the sailing rather than the, uh, rather than the biking. Oh, big time. And, and, and it really proved to be that way. I was utterly rubbish at sailing. I, um, I was so out of my comfort zone. I just wasn't cut out for that environment. I, um, I was extremely seasick every single day for an entire month. And when I arrived in Seattle, 28 days after setting off from Qingdao, I think I'd lost somewhere in the region of six or seven kilograms in weight because I, I hadn't been able to digest a single meal just through terrible seasickness. Uh, we encountered some ginormous Pacific seas. Some of these these waves that we were encountering were, yeah, I mean, like skyscrapers, basically. And we were surfing down them and up the other side. And that environment isn't for me. I think everyone has their own level of crazy. And people look at some of my bicycle adventures in which I go off and I spend three or four thousand miles on a bike and they think that's a little bit crazy. But it doesn't feel like that way to me. I feel like that's quite a normal way for me to be living. But then when I was in this environment with these crazy sailors who absolutely loved being in that situation, I realized that we were just totally different types of human being, really. It's a, it's a, it's a real challenge because it's not just physically demanding. You're faced with death every single minute of every single day. The thing I really like about cycling is that However hardcore or extreme it becomes, you can just stop. You can just put your brakes on, put your kickstand on and just chill out for five minutes. But in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, when you're in these huge tropical storms, which may be hundreds of miles wide, you can't stop. You have to keep fighting and fighting and fighting until you come out the other side. And that is quite an incredible discipline to have. I think it's difficult to imagine a group of people who are probably more different than your lone cyclist who enjoys, as you say, being out in the middle of nowhere, potentially on their own and feels comfortable doing that, heading off in their own direction, turning left when they want, turning right when they want. These are a group of people who, you know, it must be must have been presumably a bit like being in the army. You have to follow the orders of the person in charge. And personally, I would I would hate that. But these people presumably get a bus from that. I mean, th they're paid to do this. They're, they're not people who are recruited by the yacht company. They are paying themselves to have this, in inverted commas, privilege of doing this. Um, did you actually get on with them on a, on a personal level? Uh, if I'm honest, not particularly, no. Uh, so it was a difficult situation for me, really, looking back, because I was joining this 50,000 miles circumnavigation of the world after about 25,000 miles. So I was trying to introduce myself to a very established team uh, who were already in this race and doing quite well sailing around the planet. So that was already quite hard for me to try and infiltrate. Also, people are naturally quite wary of journalists. They feel like just because you're a journalist, you might be trying to expose something in some sort of way, which wasn't really the case. I, my journalistic style is just to, I guess, just document what I see and let other people make their own minds up. It also didn't really help that I was very, very unwell. And the thing is, is that 
when you do start to go down with very bad seasickness, it's not just a case of throwing up. It's seasickness and, and really acute seasickness isn't just vomiting. It is an intense nausea which prevents you from really being able to do anything. If anyone hasn't had it, just think of maybe that one time when you're a teenager and you drank far too much alcohol and it made you paralytically sick, because most people have done that at least once. Well, that feeling when it lasts for days and days and days means that you are unable to really contribute to much going on. So I had to spend a few days just in my bunk trying to make myself feel better because not only are you a liability for the people you're around but no one really wants you to be spewing up all over their feet or anything like that um so it, it was tough i i'm really glad i did it i knew it was going to be horrendous but i'm proud to say that i've sailed across the two largest oceans in the world and that's why i did it because some of the opportunities I get as a travel writer and as a journalist are things that money can't buy. I could never have dreamt of doing something like that under my own steam. And that's the greatest thing about being a journalist, really, because it opens a lot of doors. I, I think it would be a, a living hell. And, um, and I'm perfectly happy on two wheels by myself, which brings us to the bit where you cycle from Seattle, did you say? to New York. Yeah. Now, the first thing that struck me when you didn't mention this in the in the audio documentary, did you take your bike with you across the oceans or was it there in Seattle waiting for you to collect? So that was a plan. That was the initial idea, but it just became a bit of a logistical nightmare, really. And because all the yachts are trying to save as much weight as possible and move as fast as possible, not only were they slightly hesitant of the fact of having an extra 100 kilo journalist on the yacht with an extra 50 kilos of video equipment and things like that. They weren't very keen on me bringing my bike and my panniers. So uh, I managed to ship my bicycle to Seattle. So um, the first major job I had to do when I arrived in Seattle was go to a go to a warehouse just outside Seattle. I think it's uh, is it Boeing? I think Boeing are based in Seattle. I had to go there and find my bike in a crate somewhere and then put it all together. But that's pretty standard in the in the sort of jobs I do these days, shipping my bike and then having to try and find it somewhere and hope it hasn't been broken. And I'm kind of envisaging that scene from, is it Raiders of the Lost Ark? <laughs> yeah, where they, where, where he, up, he opens up the uh, the warehouse and somewhere, somewhere in there is the, the crate with the, uh, with the uh, the lost art, but uh, presumably, well, you did you did find the bike. Yeah, I did find it, and I think the thing is, is that I guess everyone listening to this and you will be able to empathise that often when we do go off on these big journeys, it can involve us having to transport our bicycles to different parts of the world, and I would say I am most nervous in that first hour of arrival to find out if my bike's been broken than any other element of the journey. I'm not nervous about a 10,000 mile bike ride or a 5,000 mile bike ride, but I am very nervous about the idea I've flown somewhere or gone somewhere with my bike to do this incredible journey I've been thinking about and planning. And I get there and I've got, I don't know, a crap frame or something like that, because it would just end the whole thing immediately. Um, so there's always quite a bit of nerves at that stage of, of any expedition. There's a chap who lives not too far from where I am. And he he does these long distance rides for um, charity. And he went to, I think it was last year or the year before, probably not 2019. He went to America with his bike or he thought he did. But when he got there, DHL, they hadn't delivered it. And um, it just has never been found. So um, wow. yeah, these things, these things do happen. I think in the end, they made a a donation to his charity but he was he was kind of stuck in america without a bike the the route that you took across america was it a was it a set route was it were you making it up on a day by day basis you were kind of racing against the clock in order to get to new york for the for when the boats arrived yes yeah, so i arrived let me think back we arrived on the 15th of april in seattle i remember it clearly because it's my birthday 
So I set foot on um, on dry land on my birthday. And then the yachts set off to New York roughly 10 days later. And that's a really long leg. It takes them about five weeks. They go around south um, into Central America and then they pass through the Panama Canal and then they race all the way up back through the Caribbean and then the eastern seaboard of um, America. So I knew I had about five weeks to get from one side of America to the other, which is actually going quite quick. Normally people give themselves maybe two or three months and I'm eager to do it again one day. And, and when I do, I'll give myself more time. But basically, I just followed a northern route through the northern states and I just sat on long, straight roads and just tried to head east. Basically, I didn't really try to navigate more than just using a compass. And all I really knew was that if in the afternoons I had the sun at my back as the sun was going over me, setting in the west, then I was heading due east and um, I always remember it was like I was I was always moving towards my shadow and yeah I didn't really plan it I just knew that if I cycled anywhere between 70 and 90 miles a day I would get there and um, I just kept going and going and going across um, uh, Montana, Idaho, uh, the Dakotas until I literally got to the, the Great Lakes and I knew that I was if I kept going I would have just plowed into the Great Lakes I had to go south and then basically turn left again and head through Pennsylvania and New York and yeah it was in the end it was 3,707 miles and I got there 12 hours before the boats um, which was very satisfying and you obviously made the radio documentary when you came back to Britain. Were you writing for the Telegraph or other people? And were you reporting on the radio throughout this journey, the, the yachting bit and the cycling bit? Yeah, there was bits and bobs. Um, I wrote a story for the Telegraph about sailing across the Pacific. I picked up two or three stories for the BBC while I was cycling across America. However, if I'm honest, I didn't really have the time. It was um, quite an intense journey and it was quite nice, to be honest. It was quite refreshing in contrast to the way I sometimes travel in terms of trying to pick up as many stories as possible. It was quite nice to just be fully consumed by the story and, and just really be there in the moment. People always ask me about my best travel adventure and stuff like that i've been to 120 countries and i've been on some crazy adventures and i would happily just zigzag around america on my bike for the rest of my life i think it is just an infinitely interesting place it is so much more diverse and interesting than maybe a lot of journalists and a lot of people give it credit for it's so easy to just simplify somewhere like the united states you know, this burger and fries depiction of America. But actually, there's almost 400 million people that live there. And there are so many individual subcultures and ethnic groups and religions and things. And I just I was totally amazed by the people I met. Um, so, yeah, I, I plan to one day just head off to America and just zigzag around America for maybe six or 12 months. Yeah, I suppose there's a tendency. I mean, I've never been to America, but um, there is a tendency to think that either all Americans are like the ones we meet here, which tend to be the the more educated ones who've got money to travel, who probably vote Democrat compared to the ones we see on the TV, especially recently, for example, who are right wing idiots. We don't see that mass of people in between um, who are just ordinary people like me and you. Yeah. And, and that that's really interesting because what I found, I've done, I do a huge amount of public speaking and I go off and talk about this journey and stuff. And um, one of the big takeaways from that journey was just how diverse and how moderate middle America really was. And I think actually when you meet people on the ground, when you actually engage with proper conversations with people like you do when you're on your bicycle, and you are going on these big journeys and you really sort of chat to people about proper things. 
I think you realize that most people are a lot more gray, if you know what I mean. No, life isn't so black and white in real life. When we have discussions or arguments about things on Twitter, especially, everything's just become so either one way or another. And actually, life's just not really like that. I have different opinions on things which change on a daily basis. And just because I feel one thing about one thing doesn't mean I necessarily think the same thing about another. And you really realize that about traveling in this slow, relaxed sort of fashion. And when you wear your heart on your sleeve, there's something about being on a bike and being on these adventures, which I just absolutely love because it reminds me that the world really is like that. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully one day I'll get the chance to visit America and find out for myself. And I'm I'm glad that Trump's now gone because I did say that I wouldn't go there while he was in charge, but he's now gone. So um, as long as he doesn't come back, <laughs> <laughs> please, know. please don't come back. Um, you mentioned there that you made two things for the BBC. Um, am I right in guessing that one of them involves cicadas? Yes. So okay. Well, hold the, hold that thought because come back to that one in a second because that relates with or well, that connects with the the trip in Scandinavia, I think. Yeah. Um, what was what was the other one? Uh, I happened to be cycling through Indianapolis on the same weekend as the Indy 500 motor race, which is um, like the world's biggest motor event or whatever most people will be aware of the indy 500 so i went uh, I, that weekend i had my microphone with me and the bbc said to me are you available to go and cover the indy 500 so uh, i parked up my bike in a local motel and then spent three days uh, basically playing the role as a um, motoring journalist uh, it was very surreal walking around um, a huge motor track where I don't know what the fact what the figures are I think it's something like half a million people turn up for this race it's absolutely crazy um, so that was the other story that was a cool experience actually I, I'm not really into motor racing but uh, it's cool to see these things in the flesh that must have played havoc with your schedule if you were just suddenly told to you've got to stay in Indianapolis for three days and you can't make any progress yeah, well, you know, the thing was, is that I was absolutely smashing it. So I was I was beating these boats by an absolute country mile. I was well ahead of them. So I actually started to take my foot off the gas a little bit because I wanted to create some sort of photo finish, I guess, to a certain extent. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't want to turn up 10 days before them because there would be absolutely nothing for me to do while I was there in New York on my own. So um, I decided to take this job and it actually ate a few days. But then the fleet of yachts, which was um, racing up through the Caribbean, they encountered a really powerful tropical storm. And this tropical storm pushed them at an alarming rate towards New York. And this meant that all of a sudden I was about 500 miles short of New York. And uh, this fleet of boats was going to arrive in probably three or four days. So I remember those three days before I arrived in New York, I had to cycle 500 miles in three days with my panniers fully loaded and pulling a trailer. Now, this was the most extreme form of physical challenge I've ever done in my life. I remember on one specific day, I had to cycle 175 miles in a 24 hour period. And then I had a few hours broken sleep and then got up and did it all again. And it was putting my my body through hell. But it meant that I could get to New York just before the yachts. And I had the, the bragging rights, I guess. When you arrived in New York, you obviously hooked up with this other boat. It wasn't the same boat that you'd traveled with across the Pacific. It was a different boat, if I'm correct in thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Did they treat you in a slightly different way? Because, you know, in, when you'd started off on the east coast of China, you presumably turned up as a journalist. But when you turned up on the east coast of America, you turned up as a journalist and also somebody who just cycled across America. So that must have done no end of good to your kind of street cred as an adventurer. Did that help? Yeah, I think so. Looking back, definitely. And I think I also just um, 
clicked a little bit more with with the crew also we were expecting at that point more favorable sailing conditions which automatically puts people slightly more at ease and we were only expecting the the, the race to maybe last two weeks as opposed to the pacific which could last last five or six so that also takes a little bit of um strain off of the situation but i would say so yeah i think having that journey behind me and that reputation having circulated amongst the crews that this cycling mad journalist has just cycled across america probably did um did me a few favors yeah so you arrive back in britain and then you decide was it the following year or a couple of years later to um embark on another journey this time uh, didn't involve any sailing as far as i'm aware through scandinavia were are we talking what 2017 2018 yeah it was roughly i think 18 months after so i dreamt up the idea for earth cycle while i was cycling across america so you mentioned the uh, cicadas earlier so the idea for earth cycle came about when i was cycling across america and i i entered the state of ohio now these cicadas they hatch from the ground only every 17 years so as i entered ohio there were billions of these things everywhere swarming around the skies and uh, while i was there I, I did a dispatch for the bbc program from from our own correspondent and this was all about how people local people were dealing with this these hatching animals and as i cycled on over the next couple of days I started thinking to myself about this concept for a project, either a, a radio broadcast or a book or even a TV show about Earth's natural cycles as seen on a bicycle. So I dreamt up this idea for a program called Earth Cycle. And the premise of Earth Cycle is to cycle big distances around the planet in interesting landscapes and often quite isolated environments and chart the seasonal cycles of planet Earth. And that's the whole idea. And then, yeah, about 18 months after getting back from that big trip, sailing and cycling halfway around the world, I went up to Arctic Norway, right to the, um, the North Cape, right up at the top of Europe and embarked upon a three and a half thousand kilometer bike ride all the way down to the southernmost point of Sweden. And that's um, that's my big project, Earth Cycle, which a couple of weeks ago won a Travel Media Award, which we're immensely proud of. My name is Simon Parker, and as a travel writer and journalist, I've reported from some of the most extreme corners of the planet. I've sailed across ferocious oceans, and trek through some of the highest mountain ranges in an effort to document the power of Mother Nature. Been absolutely destroyed by a landslide. But now I'm embarking on my next epic journey at the gentle pace of a bicycle. From high above the Arctic Circle at the summit of Norway to the foot of the Scandinavian Peninsula in Sweden. Wow. Over the course of my 2,000 mile adventure, I'll be learning about the natural cycles of the region as a green and fertile summer slides into the frozen grips of winter. I'll be searching for seasonal foods and elusive wild animals with the people that call this place their home. I'm passing through at a time of harvest and splendor and I'm seeing it all on two wheels. This is Earth Cycle. So the program is called Earth Cycle, and there are five episodes of this, and you can see them on Amazon Prime, I think, at the moment. Earth Cycle is a bit of a when I when I first heard about the program, I thought, oh, Earth Cycle, it must be somebody cycling around the Earth. But as you've explained, it's more about the um, the seasonal transitions that you encounter on the Earth rather than cycling across the Earth. Yeah, so it's a I guess a fun play on words the the uh, idea of earth cycle is combining big overland cycling journeys with specific things in the natural world specific cycles which which only happen at specific times so we shot that series in autumn and 
what we wanted to try and do was just document interesting things that happened at a very specific time of the year and autumn's brilliant for that so i went foraging with local people for seasonal mushrooms i found out about a group of people who were trying to protect an endangered bee species uh, as they were putting them uh, putting them to bed for winter i went out in the arctic ocean with a king crab fisherman just as the days were shortening and just as the seas were getting rough and we were going out and we were fishing for invasive king crabs, which was an amazing experience. And yeah, the, the whole idea and the, the specific slant of something like Earth Cycle as a show is to have some element of seasonality. And I, I think as a as a journalist, that's something which is becoming so very popular and trendy these days at the same time as something like cycling, because we're just becoming as audiences just so much more interested in you know where our food's coming from how i as the consumer can interact with things like that and we're also very interested we'll always be very interested in in wildlife and interesting animals so um we hope we've got a formula which we can now take around the world if and when the world returns to some sort of normality why did you choose scandinavia to kick the whole thing off? So we had these big ambitions of maybe cycling around the world or goodness knows what, but um, I'd done some trips. I've, I've been on some stories in Scandinavia before and it just appealed to me as the perfect place to try and kick this idea off. It is just so wild and open and generally speaking, the people there are very... Um, hospitable and they're very open to being outside and sharing the great outdoors with people that are interested in it and also the Scandinavian right to roam the fact that you can in theory camp wherever you want for a night or two providing you're respectful and you leave no trace and that was something which we really wanted to try and incorporate into earth cycle the fact that I could cycle and then just set up camp somewhere and wild camp in the middle of nowhere and again that's something which i'm really interested in as a as an adventurer i love being able to just camp wherever i want and also that's becoming a really popular trend these days so we wanted to make something which was quite topical and kind of tapped into things that people were already already interested in what was the route that you took yeah so i started off at the north cape uh, nord cap right up at the it's the very northernmost point of europe and then i followed the coast uh, the west coast of norway up in the arctic circle all the way down to around uh, trumso and buda i think you pronounce it and then around there um, the lingen alps divides norway with swindon uh, with sweden <laughs> so uh, i um, that, would be, that would be a good that would be a good uh... A good adventure. <laughs> so I um, crossed the Lingen Alps and then um, cycled over to the east coast of Sweden and then followed the Swedish coast down the Gulf of Bothnia all the way down there. And then as I got somewhere around towards Stockholm, right down there in southern Sweden, I crossed over again into the incredible wild expanses of central southern Sweden and then went over and looked at the weather islands where there was this invasive bee species I talked about earlier and then made it all the way down to the southernmost point of Sweden. And um, I guess there is this trend or this this habit I have in my work in that I really like doing things from fixed points. I, um, I like the idea of having quite specific A and B points. I've always done it when I started hitchhiking around Australia and New Zealand and stuff. I want to start at the northernmost point and I want to finish at the southernmost point. And I seem to do that across all my journeys. I'm just obsessed with these tiny little places on the map which represent these frontiers, I guess. And I just find them fascinating. Well, yeah, you should have kept going to Tarifa like I did. My plan for 2020 was to cycle from the northernmost point of Japan to the southernmost point of, of, of the Japanese main islands. Um, but clearly that had to get ditched, but uh, hopefully. Well, interestingly, 
the second series of Earth Cycle, which I've drafted, is actually rejoining that route from Malmo, where we finished, and then going all the way to Tarifa. So one thing which I always try to talk to people about or try and encourage people is that, yeah, most of us or people listening to this podcast will maybe have these big ambitions of cycling around the world or cycling to Cape Town or goodness knows what. But there are actual ways of doing these big trips in bits and in chunks. You don't have to do it all in one go. You don't have to take a sabbatical to achieve these things. You could take a month off one year and do, you know, Tarifa to Paris. And then the next year you take off another month and you do Paris to the North Cape. So there's ways of doing these things. And that's that's what I'm doing now. I haven't physically cycled all the way around the world in one go. But when I add up all of my big trips, I've definitely gone around the world at least once. Yeah, that's interesting what you've just said, because um, that reminds me of the podcast I made last year by a chap called, or about a chap called Maximilian J. St. George, and he travelled around Europe in the early 20th century, travelling, I think it was 16,000 miles, about 25,000 kilometres, and he wrote a book about it. And at the very end of his book, he says the following, such a trip is not so remarkable that anyone cannot make it. To stretch it out for 16 months over all of Europe on $250, however, one must be able to speak at least six of the principal languages and have a large amount of patience, perseverance and endurance, patience above all. But this trip could be divided into periods of three months. One trip could take up the British Isles, another Belgium, Holland and Northern France, a third Scandinavia, a fourth Germany, Austria and Switzerland, a fifth France and Spain a sixth, Italy. Anyone during the vacation months could take one of these six trips mentioned. It can be done cheaply and it's the only way of really seeing Europe. And that's where the book finishes. Your thought of, of doing that is not a new one. This dates back, uh, well, 100 years, more than 100 years. He did it on $250 overall over 16 months, obviously a long time ago. He speaks or he spoke six of the principal languages and he's got a large amount of patience, perseverance and endurance. Which of those aspects of travelling are you able also to claim as, as your own? Are you a linguist? Do you have perseverance? Do you have patience? Do you have endurance? Um, I have patience and endurance, I would say. I've never had a huge amount of money, so um, I can't say I ticked that box. Um well, he, was, he did it for $250 back in 1908, I think he did it. Well, exactly. So, yeah. And the thing is, is that you don't need a lot of cash to do these things. And actually, journeys in which you do have a lot of money, you miss all the best bits. It's too tempting to stay in a bed and breakfast or, you know, spend 100 quid on a hotel or whatever. And that, that, that there's a time and a place for that in all our lives. But actually... The best adventures come from not having a lot of cash. When I hitchhiked around Australia and New Zealand when I was 19, I had a couple of hundred pounds and I just amazing the opportunities that come to you when you when you really need them and you just got a tent and a fishing rod. That's why I think this whole thing is so popular these days. People cycling around because it does make life simple and it does make it raw and it does even for a couple of weeks. I guess, fool you into thinking that you don't really have anything and you're just a smelly man or woman on a bicycle. And, and there's something very humbling about that sort of experience in which I know will keep me going back for, well, until I, I physically can't move on a bicycle, I think. There is something nice about that minimalistic element of the whole thing. Everything that you use to survive with is carried on the bike and that's that's a nice thing you mentioned doing it in a very modest way i can't not point out that you did do the scandinavian trip on a beautiful bicycle a van nicholas bicycle now uh, i think they are listed as one of the people in the credits who've helped you with the documentary so i'm assuming that they donated the bike for you to use but it that is not a cheap bike that is a very very good quality touring bike tell us about that yes yeah, so um i guess as you move kind of up 
in the industry in journalism and journalism and you make documentaries and things, you you start to get opportunities of people wanting to give you nice things. And as a journalist, I always battle with this because I consider myself to be a, a so-called proper journalist, I guess, and I, I don't want to interfere what I create with any sort of branding or anything like that. But yeah, a, um, a conversation began with myself and Van Nicholas at some point, and they offered to give me a bike for the trip and um, for nothing in return other than the fact that it would just be in the in the series. I would never do anything which looked a bit fake or anything like that, but they were just like, yeah, it's a great big journey. This is the sort of thing that we do. And um, by all means, we can send you a bike. And that is Van Nicholas I do incredible bikes. I'm actually really lucky. They've just sent me another one uh, for um, for another trip I'm, I'm planning uh, soon. It's all just about creating these relationships with like-minded people who really, who who I guess um, share the same the same belief in the, in the projects you're doing. Is the Van Nicholas bike that you used, and perhaps the one that they've just sent you, are they the titanium versions of the touring bike? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're all fully titanium and they have carbon fibre forks. They are um, amazing bikes. I've never yeah. ever had a single problem with any of the um, the hardware. I mean, just it's, they're just indestructible. Touch wood. Occasionally, I have to replace some of the moving parts, but with the sort of roll-off hub on the back, um, those things are just amazing pieces of kit. Uh, so, for example, when I cycled across America, to put it into some sort of context, I had a 500-pound bike that I bought off the shelf in Halfords. So um, back then, I had pretty much nothing, but I wanted to do this trip, and all I could afford was a 500-quid bike, which was already had about six or seven years in it. But then uh, over time, you, I guess you show people what you're capable of doing on rubbish stuff. And then you get these amazing opportunities when people want to give you nice things. But those roll off hubs combined with a titanium touring bike, it's like a, a Lamborghini. It is. I remember seeing a version of that Van Nicholas bike at the bike show probably about five years ago, uh, the titanium one. And I remember looking at the price of that and thinking, my God. You know, that is just a beautiful, beautiful bike. My bike at the moment, um, which I bought uh, about 18 months ago, is a Koga. And Koga actually are part of the same group, I think, as Van Nicholas. But also, interestingly, Rally are also part of that same group of companies. So, um, you know, perhaps you could start on a rally and make your way up and then eventually you get to the the top rung of the uh, of the the cycling equipment ladder and land yourself a van nicholas but they are beautiful things yeah i think um like i say it all depends on you know i'm not a cycling influencer or anything like that i um i'm a journalist and uh i would never do anything to infringe upon my reputation as a journalist um the bike did look very clean all the time. Did they did they tell you keep it clean? It was raining all the time. And actually, the great thing about cycling in Scandinavia is the roads are brilliant. So you can do most of the thing without really having to do too much off-road. Yeah, it was great. I loved that bike. Um, I recently cycled the length of Britain on the same one. I struggle with the Brook saddle sometimes. It takes me a while to get into that. that my goodness, that can be painful. I'm not one of those cyclists who is evangelical about the Brooks saddle, if I'm totally honest. I meet a lot of hardcore cycle tourers who swear by them, but... Uh... I, 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 I am one of them. I am one of them. I, uh, they, they are so comfortable because they, they're so hard that they are so comfortable. And they're also, because they're leather, your backside slides up and down when you're moving. Yeah. So the, the, amount, the amount of friction is pretty minimal i i swear by them but once you do get used to them yeah but i do find the breaking in process to be quite torturous (laughs) yeah um right going back to the uh, scandinavian trip now i'm going to play devil's advocate here but i am genuinely fascinated by the answer to this you see nowadays quite a few documentaries perhaps not people traveling on bicycles but you see quite a lot of travel documentaries on the television And at one end, 
you've got people like Simon Reeve, who kind of, you know, who does the full thing. And at the other end, you've got the likes of Joanna Lumley, who make this beautiful cinematic film. And really, they don't mention the fact that they are making a documentary. So on your film, you are seen alone. You're portrayed as travelling alone. But that's not actually the reality, is it? You are travelling with a group of other people who are filming, who are directing, who are perhaps doing some of the logistics. How accurate a representation of the real trip was it? Well, I would say quite an accurate one, because although you would think that that was the case, we tried to make this programme on a very small budget. And as soon as you introduce an extra member of the crew, it can cost you goodness knows how many thousands of pounds a week or whatever. So most of the time we shot Earth Cycle, just me and one other cameraman. And we occasionally had we had a crossover at one point between two camera operators. So we had maybe one week in which there were two. But generally, I was only ever shooting with one person. And I did so much setup ahead of time that I knew where I was meant to be on each day. Because the thing is, is that although at its like first appearance, something like Earth Cycle is a cycling documentary, there's only so much cycling you can really portray before it gets really, really boring. There has to be something else to it. So if you watch Earth Cycle, you realise that there are features within it where I go and meet people and talk to them about their lives or something interesting they're doing. So that's a really important element to making a programme. It can't just be me on a bike talking about how tough my bike ride is because it's just so boring after a while. But yeah, I mean, what we want to try and do as journalists, as creatives, is to try and create a sense of place, try and create an interesting story without, if possible, breaking down that fourth wall. There has to be a, a suspension of disbelief because it's not just me recording my ride on a GoPro. In order for it to look interesting and for people to sit in their living rooms and be enthralled by this program, there has to be some level of production values involved. So there was um, myself, a director, my, my partner on the program, Cliff, um, at 1080, 1080 Media TV. Um, and uh, then there was a couple of editors back at the production station and then maybe two people uh, filming. So I think there's probably about half a dozen people involved, which in terms of television is extremely small. The a production crew can be much, much bigger than that, but we just couldn't afford it. We wanted to get the program made. And if we would have waited around forever and ever to get all the correct funding and things like that, it would never have happened. So we were eager to get it done and we, and we did it. Yeah, I suppose it's a fine line between making sure that you're creating something that is worthy of being watched in terms of its technical uh, prowess, in terms of its production values, but also balancing that with not creating something where people just sit in their, on their sofas and think, he never cycled that, that's just um, all made up. And I have to say, you, you do a brilliant job. I never once thought he's never not cycled from A to B. I always believed that you, you did cycle all the, the, the full distance, so you did a good job. I'm a bit of, a, I don't know what the word is, I'm a stickler for these things. I want to do it all. I'm only cheating myself if I don't. And actually, if you don't have that rush of adrenaline and a camera stuck in front of your face, it's very, uh, it's very hard to kind of fake it. I, occasionally, you know, we might have for me to cycle back and come back into shot and do that again because someone coughed or a bird flew into shot or something like that. When you do it like that, you lose that feeling of impetus. You lose that feeling of adrenaline, which captures the moment that you want to try and capture. Uh, so, yeah, I like doing these things. You know, I'm only cheating myself if I don't. And the, the small team that you had, were, were they, presumably they were in a vehicle following you and were they also camping with you or were they in booked into local hotels? Yes. Yeah, so... Um, I mean, this is a little kind of behind the scenes sort of tidbit. So 
they followed me in a car. We had this big estate type thing, which was full of um, material and full of stuff. And I think we probably wild camped two out of every three nights. But the reality of making a program is that we need to charge up all of our stuff. We can't just go on this journey and expect to document it with cameras without any battery. And what we realized when we were plotting out the series was that over the course of 30 days, in each episode, for example, you might only see one or two camping scenes. So actually, we needed logistically to fit in two days a week where we had to go and stay in a bed and breakfast or something just to try and make it's just it, these things have to be thought about behind the scenes but then when you put the program together you create this sense of place that creatively skips over those little bits because the viewer doesn't need to know about all those things the viewer just wants to sit down and be transported to an interesting place basically so it's all kind of this little bit of trickery which goes on behind the scenes yeah no i think you did a you did a really good job and uh, you know all credit to to you and the and the team who who made what is it's not a typical cycling documentary it's not kind of mark beaumont or you know some of these films that you see because they are all about the cycling what you've managed to do is create something which is well hopefully like my books cycling is an important aspect of it but there's far more which is also interesting which is going on around you um just one question actually about the people that you met did that because presumably you were you'd arranged to meet the, all those people in advance did that cause issues with timing in the same way that your yacht back on the east coast of america had meant that you had to be in a certain place at a certain time occasionally there was a few times where we would have to call people and say really sorry but i'm going to be be there in a couple of days and thankfully everyone's generally quite chilled about those things before I go off on these big journeys, yeah, I try and set up sort of the meat on the bone, really, because, um, like I say, these things can't just be about me and my bike. Because I've read cycling books about m men on their bikes, and I get bored. I get so bored by them. It's not journalism. It's just sort of saying, "Oh, I'm really sweaty and my legs hurt, and I need some food." And there's, I can't handle that. So I want to make programs that I would want to watch myself. What I try to do is I try to plot out on a big piece of paper exactly where I think I'm going to be each day. And what I'll always try and do is underplay those potential mileages. I think 50-ish miles is probably the sweet spot um, in terms of gauging where I'm going to be each day. Because the thing is, what you have to remember with something like Earth Cycle, it's not just me on my bike. There are several people involved and lots of things can change. And ultimately, our main focus of these big rides is to make a program. That is what we're going out to try and achieve. So if the cameraman gets a shot of me coming down a big hill and it's rubbish, I have to go all the way back up to the top of the hill and then come down again, because ultimately we want the best material for when we put it all together. The team behind the, the project, 1080 Media TV and the, the editors and the cameramen and stuff, like they have a they have the most difficult job, really, in the fact that they are always having to remind me that, yeah, there's a program which comes out of this at the end and we need to be mindful of what we're recording and, and what that's going to look in the in the final product, I guess. To what extent do you think that actually and most people do this? Most people take a camera with them. Most people uh, might even create some video. Uh, increasingly, some people might even make a video that they upload to YouTube or they may, they might um, make some audio recordings and make a podcast, something like that. It's something that's quite accessible now to almost everybody simply because the technology is pretty easy to get hold of and pretty easy to use. What advice would you offer to people who do want to do that, who do want to make, not for broadcast, but simply for their own pleasure, an audio recording, an audio record of what they've done in terms of a journey, whether it be on a bike or not? In terms of audio, my journalistic background is, I guess, one of the things we're always trying to do is create a sense of place. That's quite an overused um, concept. But for example, that BBC um, documentary I made, that audio documentary for the World Service, 
a lot of the sound effects which you hear in that I actually recorded afterwards and then I've edited those in at the right times to accentuate my script and accentuate, accentuate what's happening at the time. You know, just cycling along a road with a microphone you're going to get really, really bad sound effects. You're just going to get noise on the mic. You're going to get wind. You're going to get rain. It's not going to sound very good. But if you put a bicycle upside down in your garage and then record a, a wheel going round or the gears changing or whatever, you end up with these really nice, succinct, clean audio files, which you can then edit in with all of your other content. So for me, it's a it's it's not doesn't have to be a perfect completely true depiction of exactly what happened at that time i'm much more interested in making something which is entertaining for the consumer and the viewer or the reader at the end for me it's about creating this composite that becomes interesting content and i think a lot of people don't quite grasp that because they always think that you know like it has to be recorded at that moment well actually there are little ways of fudging that and you just kind of learn those things over time i guess okay just to finish with you've mentioned that you'd like to finish the nordcap to tarifa journey with another series potentially and you know certainly you'll have me as watching if you do but more generally in terms of i mean i mentioned japan earlier and I'm kind of thinking, well, 2021, is that a realistic prospect of cycling the length of J uh, Japan this year? What's your take? Do you think this summer we will be in any position to head off anywhere further than the British Isles? I'd be surprised. I don't think I would be planning very ambitious trips beyond Britain. Uh, that's why I'm already planning another big cycle ride for spring. I think by mid-summer, we should be relatively safe. But then the problem is, is will we be able to go and gallivant in other people's countries who are not as up to speed as we are? Um, I don't know. I, I really think that we're going to see quite a big boom in cycle touring in Britain this summer. I really hope that something like Earth Cycle and something like all the other cycling projects I do is slightly ahead of the curve in that sense that actually this is going to be a, a crest of a wave really because you know on a bicycle or in a small group of people you are in your own moving little bubble and actually being on your own bike being in a tent somewhere it's totally self-contained so I don't see why that wouldn't be more popular and I'm eager to get out and see more of Britain uh, this summer especially. I'm giving a talk at the Cycle Touring Festival all about touring during a pandemic because I, I went on a cycle tour last summer around uh, the British Isles to Edinburgh, Belfast, Cardiff and then to London and it was an interesting experience in light of the fact that we were kind of living through the pandemic at the time so I may actually play what you just said there because I think it's quite interesting but that actually you did do your own journey around Britain last year that we haven't really mentioned and you're planning to write a book about that is that right yes yeah, so um last october i was sick and tired of all of my international trips being cancelled and uh, i needed to basically make some money and also just reignite my spirit of adventure i guess because i was just like everyone else just feeling a bit lost and dejected about this world that we'd found ourselves in. So I dreamt up this idea called Britain by Bike and uh, I cycled 1,307 miles all the way from the northernmost point of Shetland all the way down to the southernmost point of Cornwall in Land's End and uh, I made a seven-part series for the Telegraph um, articles and films all about finding out how Britain was feeling during the pandemic. And I met dozens of people and told their stories. I met astronomers, I met fishermen, I met farmers, cheesemakers, loads of interesting people whose lives had been changed by the pandemic. And uh, yeah, in hopefully as soon as we can, I'm hoping April or maybe May, my plan is to go back down to Land's End and then cycle all the way back up there. 
and by the time I've finished all going to plan, it will be 3,000 miles around Britain during the pandemic. And I'm currently in the process of putting a book proposal together um, to hopefully write it up and, and people will be able to read that um, hopefully late 2021. Just picking up on what you just said, you're going to go back down to Land's End and cycle all the way back up to northern Shetland. Are you going to revisit the places that you went last year? No. So what I'd like to do is um, on the first part of the journey, I went across the top of Scotland and then down the west coast and then basically followed the western contours of Great Britain. What I want to do next is cycle all the way along the south coast of England to the southernmost point of Kent. And then what I want to do is basically follow the coast all the way back up to the top of Scotland. And when I've looked at the map, I'm basically creating this lasso around Britain. Uh, by going around the edge of it. It would be nice to go and revisit those people. I hadn't really given that too much thought, but actually for me, I think all the stories I found had a lot of similarities running through them. There was this feeling of being lost. There was this feeling of not really knowing what was going on in the world. And what I realized was that we're all feeling exactly the same. And I, me uncovering these stories could be anyone really. So what I want to try and do is find different interesting people along the way, all the way up. So in the first half of, of the project, in the first half of the book, there might be 50 individual people all telling me their own little stories. When I go back up, there'll hopefully be 50 more because like I've said throughout this podcast, I'm, I'm desperate for people to tell me their stories. I don't want it to just be about me. Um, I guess that's just what we're trying to achieve as journalists really okay well i think that's been fascinating and uh thank you for taking up the the minor challenge of answering my questions but yeah that is genuinely very very interesting and obviously people can go and find your work you can go onto bbc sounds and you can certainly find the documentary about the trip from china to europe and obviously the recent cycle from Nordcap down to southern Sweden, you can find currently on Amazon Prime. Yep, definitely. Yeah, it's all available. Just check out my social media channels and things like that, and you can link through to any of that. And uh, I'm always open to chatting to people on social media. If someone says, oh, I was really intrigued by so-and-so or whatever, yeah, let's, um, I can direct you towards a certain link if there's something that you're interested in. And your website is Simon wparker.co.uk yep. and you can find lots of information there as well so thank you for speaking to me on the podcast and uh, happy travels in the future wherever they may be yeah thank you very much uh, to everyone listening it's hopefully the world's going to return to some normality now and i think there's going to be this pent-up demand and enthusiasm to get out there and explore i know that's how i'm feeling and i'm, I'm pretty sure everyone listening to this is feeling the same I am really struggling and it's really dawning on me that this is not just a journalistic pursuit, that this is a, an endurance feat in its own right. And I've been on the bike now for about eight or nine hours and there's just hill after hill after hill and I'm surviving pretty much solely on sugar and that's just not working, I'm starting to crash now. I'm desperate for a good meal, but I've pretty much run out of all of my food. This is a massive challenge. This part of my journey was always going to be the hardest physically. I'm trying to cover between 80 and 100 miles a day, and despite entering the significantly more populated region of central Sweden, the distance between towns is still often massive especially considering I'm now so exhausted I'm creeping along at about seven miles per hour. Often I'm not seeing another human being for an hour or two at a time, and when a shop does eventually come along, I have to stock up on enough food to keep me going for what could be a day or two. Peanuts, perfect for energy. Bananas, definitely. On trips like these, I find myself surviving on huge amounts of carbohydrates. Bread, pasta, rice and cakes, literally anything to keep me pedalling and moving forward. And today has been particularly gruelling. 
I've cycled 93 miles, that's 150 kilometers, and I'm in a desperate need of a rest. Now this has been an extremely long day and I had absolutely no idea where I was going to end up, but this place looks amazing. Undercover, right next to the lake, extremely cool.